excited about uh, teaching this series that we are, I started to say entering into, but I actually began teaching this uh, a few weeks ago, about a month ago, with the first one. And the, the name of the series is uh, um, Scepter of Justice. I had a blank there for a second. The name of the series is Scepter of Justice. And just a few weeks ago when I began that, I shared with you why Holy Spirit put that in my heart. And so I started with the service, the title, the first one was Judgment or Justice. I'm going to hit that just a little bit again today before we move along so that there's a clear understanding of why this is important. And I said to the leadership team before we came out this morning, probably could not have, and I didn't do this intentionally, I did not plan to start this series today or the one that I'm speaking of today, Seeking Justice, because it is what we regard as Easter Sunday. See, to me, Christ is resurrected every day. He's resurrected in my life. Every day, He does something new in my life. Every day, He's my Savior. Not just today, but every single day. So I recognize that when I begin to speak of seeking justice, I saw Holy Spirit begin to show me how that connects to who He is and what this day represents in the lives of so many. And I said to the team, often when I'm teaching, or anyone's teaching, often it will be a word for a few or the many, but not necessarily the all, not necessarily everyone that's present. I don't believe that's true of this series. I believe that this series is a word for every single person that is going to hear my voice today and next week and the week after. So this week, I'm going to continue on with seeking justice. Next week, we'll be declaring justice. And then the following week will be justice served. And all of those will make sense as we move along. But I want to begin today by helping you to understand what it means. And I'm going to start with a statement born out of something that I read. So I was reading, uh, I read... All my news, I no longer get a newspaper, but I enjoy the news. I like to hear the thoughts. What, what is society thinking? What does the world, how do they view things today? And how do I differ from what they see? And how do they differ from what I see? So an article caught my attention this week. You may have seen it, and, I, and I'm not sure who wrote it. So I hope I don't get in trouble for not giving credit where credit is due. I'll just tell you, I didn't say this. I didn't write this. And I didn't find the statistics. I used what whoever did it used. So the article was basically this. It was religion or religiosity. I can't remember exactly. But religiosity is coming apart or unraveling or dying in America. And I looked at that article. It caught my attention. So I thought, what does this mean? And again, that isn't the exact title. So if you're searching for it online, that will not find what you're looking for. But I read the article, and what the article was implying and suggesting and stating based on statistical polls, it asked, over the years, every few years they take these polls, and it said in there, it said that the people that attend church regularly now, it measured that up against people who attended church regularly previously in years gone by. And it used a couple of dates, and one of those was in 1982 when I was 19 years old. It was a couple years ago. But in 1982, 70, and babe, help me remember what the exact number, I, I want to say it was 70, 79%. 79%, I may have that off by a degree or two. But in 1982, 79% of America attended church regularly, meaning weekly. 79%. As of last month, when the poll was completed, 48% of American citizens attend church regularly. And as we, as I was sharing this this morning, Tim Carney had a very similar, uh, almost mirror uh, view of what that meant. And I can tell you that For me, I wasn't disturbed by the fact that people are no longer going to church in the same way that he was not. I wasn't disturbed by the fact that the numbers have dwindled. 
I was disturbed by the fact that people are disturbed because people aren't going to church. I was disturbed by the fact that people are still expecting in 2021 the church to be exactly the same way it was in 1982. It bothers me that the church has come to a place where there is a, we assimilate or assimilate going to church with holiness. And as I began to read and continue to read the article and then finish the article, I realized that the way God works in people's lives, and this is going somewhere, so walk with me, but the way God works in people's lives, it isn't because we gather in church on Sunday and hope that somehow he gets me through what I walked out this week. If our hope is that he is always the band-aid for my bruise, then he will never become the savior of my soul. Am I making sense? And I begin to think about the nature of change and how God does things and how he changes who we are. And I thought about, I don't have it on me, but I am an iPhone person. I'm a Mac guy, and everybody that knows me knows that. But I was holding in my hand the iPhone, and I begin to think about all the different iterations of the iPhone. I started with the first one. Once I laid hands on the very first iPhone, I knew that nothing would ever compare in my lifetime. I came to that conclusion. People are diehard with whatever they've got, and they like it. Samsung people, or not Samsung, Android people love Android. Apple people love Apple. Apple people love Apple because it works. Android people love Android because it's cheaper. But it's... (laughs) So it kind of lets you know where people's mind runs. But... But as I looked at that first iteration of iPhone... And I, or not the, the, the iteration I have now, which is the, I think the 11. And I looked at that and I began to think all the way back to whatever the number of the first one. I don't think they started with one. I think they started with two or three or so. I don't remember, but it, it's irrelevant. Whatever they started with, I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, you know, this thing did not change over time. In fact, this version of the iPhone that I hold in my hand is not a lot different than version, what, eight or nine. What you see doesn't look incredibly different from the iterations prior to it. But what is within what I see has changed dramatically. When you look at the iPhone today, and I'm using that because that's what I have, but when I look at that today, I realize that I hold in my hand a computer that has more ability than the first compact computer that my wife and I owned after we married. This thing is faster, it is better, it is smaller, I can hold it to my head, I can put it in my pocket, it's near indestructible. I can do all of these things. That compact computer that I had back in 1993 couldn't even compare to what this is. And I begin to reflect on how what happened with Steve Jobs and as he began to put this together and it's not just the iPhone it's also your Android those of you that have the cheap phones you know this happens slower but it happens but what happens is these changes do not happen in what you see right off the bat changes first happen internally the inner mechanics of something gets worked on, the ideas are laid out there, blueprints, patents, everything's applied for or stolen in the case of Android. But you get, you got all the, I'm, I'm, I'm being ugly, I'm being ugly. I'm, if you have an Android fo- phone, if you suffer if you choose. And I'll stop with that. But, um, and I'm not giving the mic to anyone else, so don't even ask. Especially, let me see what, hold, give me, show me your phone first. But the inner mechanics... And you guys know I'm kidding, right? I'm not. It's all good. Everything I said is true. 
But the inner mechanics of a phone or a computer or a car or a name it, the inner workings always change first. In the outside of that, the cover that's on that doesn't always reflect what's going on on the inside right off the bat. And all of this relates to where we're going today. And I'm going to begin by reading this statement as we begin the series or continue the series today with Seeking Justice. If you want to follow along, the easiest way to do that is right there on the Holy Bible app and click on the events and it will have the scripture laid out there for you. You're going to want that today because I'm going to be reading out of a book of the Bible that you probably haven't read in a long time in just a moment. But if you want to go to the Holy Bible app and look that up, you can do that. We'll also be putting it on the screen. But I want to read this statement. Religion will always remind you of the laws of the past and your failure to keep them. The kingdom will always remind you of the possibilities in tomorrow and God's promise that you can achieve them. I'm going to read it again. Religion will always remind you of the laws of the past and your failure to keep them. Religion imprisons people and causes them to believe every day that somehow they have come up short. In religion, you never really believe that you are truly a son of God. Remember, he called all of us sons. Religion will never let you believe that you truly are a joint heir. It will let you believe that you get real close, but there's still so much in you that prevents you from actually becoming that heir. So religion will always remind you of the laws of the past and your failure to keep them, but the kingdom will always remind you of the possibilities in tomorrow and God's promise you can achieve them. So today, we will continue the series, Scepter of Justice. Uh, Part one was Judgment or Justice. And if you've missed that, I would encourage you to either listen on the Rock podcast or uh, if you want to watch it, you can watch it on the Rock YouTube channel. So, seeking justice, what does that mean? In light today of celebrating Resurrection Day, this word is very fitting. I want you to think of this with me. Judgment birthed law. Because of judgment, law was born. Justice gives us a savior, an alternative. Justice has nothing to do with law. It has everything to do with promise. And that's the difference. So go with me in the book of Amos, if you would, in the First Testament today. Amos chapter 5. If you find Daniel in your Bible and you go Hosea, Joel, Amos will be right along there. So in the First Testament, find Daniel. It's easier to find and then move right a few books and you'll find Amos. So Amos chapter 5. I'm going to read this today. And when I read this, I want you to hear some of the key words that you're going to find. I'm using this because I want to read much of chapter 5 this morning. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen, no more to rise, is the virgin Israel. Forsaken on her land with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, The city that went out a thousand shall only have a hundred left. That which went out a hundred will only have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Everybody say seek. Seek. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel. And do not enter into Gilgal. Or cross over to Beersheba. Don't go to those places where you've been before. Those places you thought gave you life before doesn't mean they're going to give you life today. For Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel will come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood. O you 
who take justice and turn it to wormwood. Oh, you who look at justice and say you are, you have no value. You that say to justice, I have no right to seek you. There's no hope in you. You who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. Yahweh, the Lord, is his name. Who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. Just bear with me. They hate him who reproves in the gate. And they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, people of Israel, children of Israel, on this day, therefore, because you trample on the poor, those of you who do not think justice is significant, because you think you count it as wormwood, therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you will not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you will not drink its wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, then will be with you as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all squares there will be wailing and in all the streets they will say, alas, alas. They shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation. They're going to get those people that cry really well. And they're going to gather them together. And in all the vineyards there will be wailing, for I will pass through your midst. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion, and running from the lion he ran into a bear. And if the bear didn't get him, he went into the house, leaned his hand against the wall, and he was bit by a serpent. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts. Now listen, I know you're probably thinking, where in the world is this going on Resurrection Sunday? Hang with me. He said, I hate, I despise your feasts. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice Roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Why is it that the Father is looking at these and He is speaking to them and He is addressing them and He's frustrated that they've, they've done something? Something has happened that has caused the Father to say, when you seek me, you're going to really struggle to find me. When you need me to come, it's going to be difficult for me to do that because you're going to expect me to bring something to you that you are not willing to also give. And he said, what you didn't do was you did not value, if we go all the way back to verse whatever it was, 15, I think, you did not value justice. You looked at justice and you said, this is no better than wormwood. This is no better than the thing that we just, we get out of our yard because we count it as nothing. But the Father says, there's something I want for you. The Father's declaring, I want to do something on behalf of those who call me Lord. 
Those who look to me and call me God. Those who know my name and call me Yahweh. I want to do something for you. But I cannot do for you justice if there is no justice in your own gate. He said, you look past the one sitting on the wall. You look past the one who is in need. You gave them nothing to build with, but you built houses hewn out of beautiful stone. Is that justice? Is that justice? So the father said, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about God. For anybody that might be uncertain about the father, let me tell you something about God. No one desires justice more than he. He's a God that both issues judgment and sets forth justice. He is a God that understands what it is to judge and doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to say to one, you forever will be in eternal darkness and say to another, welcome to the light. What he wants to do is he wants to say to everyone, everything that I am is available to everything that you are and all who you are, whoever you are. He doesn't want to have to judge, but judgment is necessary. But this today is about the justice that is served. So let's talk about that this morning. So not too long ago, and I shared this when I talked the first time, and let's bring this to a point here. But not too long ago, my wife and I went to see a friend of mine, and again, I'd shared this before, but we went to see a friend, so I'll be brief, and in the visiting of the friend, we had a great conversation, and he began to talk to me about some things that he was seeing and hearing, and some of that was about justice, and I really had never considered the idea of justice prior to that. I know the word, I'm familiar with it, I'm familiar with the difference between judgment and justice, Um, that's really a simple thing to understand, I think, or to me it was. Uh, But I never really considered how justice related to the kingdom of God. And my wife began to share with him a situation that was, uh, she was walking through, uh, walking out with her and her brother, actually. And they were walking out this situation. And Aaron, uh, this this friend of mine, (laughs) he asked a simple question. And he said, um, he said, uh, have you, have you declared justice? And we looked at him like a deer in the headlights. Have we done what? He said, have you decreed any justice? Hmm. Think about that for a second. Probably not because I don't have any idea what you're talking about. He said, well, this is what you need to do. So he hands me this physical object. And he said, and I'm condensing this into a very small story, but he hands me this physical uh, object, and I take this object in my hand, and he says, now decree justice over the situation, declare justice, and I said, I don't, it's really weird, (laughs) I don't know how to do that, it's it's strange, you know, it's, I was, I was almost embarrassing, I was like, and, and my wife is looking at me, she's standing there, Go on. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and I'm standing here with this thing in my hand, and I feel like I'm on one of those television shows where I have no idea they're actually filming. But I knew in my heart, like many of you already, if you're not there, you will be there, but already in your heart, you know exactly where I'm going with this, and you know you understand it, but you, you can't visualize it yet, but you get it. So I said, I'm just going to do what I know to do. And all I can think about is a courtroom, the courtroom of Solomon is what I consider, where when the scepter was laid down, it meant one thing. When the scepter was held up, it meant another thing. So what I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume from my, what I understand, the courtroom of Solomon. So what I understand is I'm just going to respond to that. Because that's the level of knowledge that I have about this thing that I'm holding in my hand and this thing, this word justice, that you are declaring to me or you are speaking to me. And I took this scepter and I began to speak and I said over the situation that my wife and brother were dealing with, I took my, this scepter and I just kind of waved it and I, and I just spoke to justice. And I said, justice, will, is, justice is coming. By the time we got to our hotel that night, justice had come. 
Justice had come. Up until that time, it was an unknown. Judgment, now, had already happened. And this is what you need to understand this morning. Justice and judgment are not the same thing. Judgment always precedes justice. Now, judgment comes because, and this is what I want to say to you today, judgment can only come if justice is sought. When we seek justice, judgment comes. But when judgment comes, that doesn't mean justice has happened at the same time. Give you an example. Let's use the guy that you always see on TV. I won't say his name, but he's a blonde headed guy, blonde headed white guy you see on commercials all the time. And people get in car wrecks and they say, This guy got me $500,000. <laughs> you don't like them any more than I do. <laughs> Not the people, but the commercials. And then he's, you got this guy on there and he's got this little quirky smile. No one ever said, and we got him, 300,000 of our 500,000. That's beside the point. That's in the fine print at the bottom of the screen. But I'm going to use that as a point of reference because this will make sense to you. Anyone who has ever been in court for any reason at all, uh, you will understand what I'm about to say. And even if you haven't, I hope it will make sense to you. So what happens is, let's say John Doe gets into a car wreck. He gets in that car wreck. And when he does, uh, he finds that, you know what, my back is sore. And it, it really doesn't matter to the court of law whether his back really is sore. They just, all he's got to do is say it is sore. So the guy says, my back is sore or the girl or whoever they are, this happened to me in this wreck. Now, I believe that because of that, I should not be the one to pay for the care of that sore back. So in their mind, something begins to work. Track with me this morning. In the same way that in your mind, there are things that have gone on in your life that have happened in your life spiritually, naturally. There are things that have happened that in your mind, in your thought process, you're thinking, well, I should not be responsible for this. And because of that, this guy that gets in the car wreck, he is processing, I shouldn't be responsible for the chiropractic care, for the doctor care, for the sur- whatever might happen, so I'm going to seek justice. Justice is an answer to the thing that I'm walking through. But what he cannot do is simply say, my back hurts, I'm going to the chiropractor uh, because of my back, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock on the door of the guy that hit me, and I'm going to knock on their house door, their home address, and I'm going to say, you have to pay for my chiropractor. You have to pay for my care. Because that person is going to look at him and say, you have lost your ever-loving mind. Get off my property. Do you know who Smith and Wesson are? Is, that would be an is. You can't get justice that way. Before justice, you have to begin by seeking justice. And when you begin to seek justice, that begins to move the ball downfield. So you seek justice. So the guy's got this pain and he says, he calls up this blonde headed guy that's on TV all the time or billboards everywhere in Orlando. And he calls up this blonde headed guy and he says, listen, Dan, or listen, Blondie. <laughs> Man, I hope I, don't have to, I hope I don't have to pay a fee for this. Listen. I was in a car wreck. I hurt my back. Now I have to go to the doctor. I'm paying all the bills. I don't think I should have to pay the bills. And then Blondie says to him, Why don't you come and meet with me? You sit down with me and let's talk about where you're at. He goes and he sits down with him. They discuss the circumstances and he says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go to court. We're going to file a lawsuit against that insurance company. And we're going to see if we can't get them. And I'm sure Blondie's probably saying, I am absolutely certain we're going to make you a wealthy man. Maybe he didn't say that. Shouldn't say that because he might sue me. But he says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go to court. Now that you are seeking justice, you have authorized me to move the ball to the first down line. If you had not come in here and begin to seek justice, I would not be authorized to pursue justice. So then... 
He does whatever they do. Blondie does whatever they do to set up a court date. They go to court. In the courtroom, the judge agrees. And the judge says, you know what, John Doe, you and Blondie, you're right. Blondie has argued well on your behalf. And we're going, this is my judgment. My judgment is you will be awarded 500, because everybody he does business with just about gets 500,000. So I'm using that number. You, I'm going to award you $500,000. 500,000, that is the judgment. Now, do they get that right away? They got a judgment on paper. But now what's going to happen is, justice has not yet been served. He got a judgment, right? The judge agrees, you deserve this. But the judge cannot force anyone to make a payment. He can only issue a statement, a decree. This is what happened. This is my judgment. And then the insurance company can fight back. They can appeal. They can do all the things that they do. When is justice served? I'm going to answer that for you. Justice is served when he gets the 500000 Not when he gets the judgment. The judgment, many people around you today and in life, when they do this same thing, they're seeking justice for something. What happens a lot of times, especially in small claims court, what will happen in small claims court is, or divorce court, if you watched any of those shows, what you'll find is the judge will make a judgment and he will say, you're going to be awarded this. And he notes that in his paper, it becomes, this is going to happen for you. But the person he's saying that has to pay this, they might say, we don't have the money. So what the judge will do is he will say, then we're putting a lien on your assets, whatever they are, your home, your business, your retirement. We're going to put a lien on that, which means when a lien is placed, the home cannot be sold until the debt is paid. The assets cannot be cashed out. You don't get your retirement money until the judgment is met with justice. So there is a period between the time judgment was given and justice is served. I want to focus back again on verse 15. He says, establish justice in the gate, and then verse 24, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness will follow. I want you to understand something today. I believe this, since I sat with my friend and he began to cause me uh, this word to come alive in me about justice, it's his fault I'm teaching this today. But it's a right word and this series, I believe, is going to cause you to come into a place where judgment has been passed in many places and in many ways on every single life in this room. But you have not received the justice do you. We have a very, um, no, I'm not even going to go there. But you're due justice, and justice will come, but it does not come until we seek it. Very same way when I received Christ, when you received Christ. Those of you that know God, those of you that have received Christ, you repented of your sins, you sought something. Whatever day that that happened for you, whatever moment that happened for you, wherever that happened for you. There was a, a, a point in time when something in you called Holy Spirit began to stir you and make you aware that there's more. There's more to me than what I see when I look in the mirror. And he began to awaken himself within you. So you said, Father, forgive me. I understand what I need to do. I thought earth and world and living was all about me, but it's not all about me. You created me for a purpose, and when they come into that understanding that I was created for a purpose, and, and I don't want to try to make all the decisions on my own, I want, you're the one that created me, and I want to honor you with this creation. So I repent of my sins. At that moment, the Father says, I judge your sin to no longer be accountable to you. And then justice is served every single day that you walk out your relationship with him and he begins to unleash to you every single promise that he had. You no longer are looking at the first statement that I shared today. You're not 
under the oppression of the laws of religion, but you are under the freedom of the relationship that you are promised with an almighty God. Do you hear me today? Judgment for Adam and Eve was, you're going to birth children and it's going to be painful for Adam. It was, you're going to live off the land by the sweat of your brow and generation after generation. This is the judgment for your sin. But then the second Adam came called the Christ. And when the Christ came, when he sent the Christ, opportunity was there. And those who seek justice, the justice is redeem, redemption. Justice is redemption for you. It is redemption for me. Those who seek the Christ will be redeemed by the Christ. And justice will come to those. Christ in every way is the justice that God sent to you and me to remove us from that law. And bring us into a place of relationship. To remove us from that place where we're every day measuring ourselves up against the things that we didn't do right. And we go to bed at night and we we begin to tally that on our piece of paper. Well, today I did good. I only committed 10 sins. Yesterday I was 11. It was a record today. Today I didn't need as much forgiveness. And justice isn't you being reminded every day how wrong you are. Justice is you knowing every day how much of God lives in you and how much of Him in you He wants to bring alive in you. That's justice. When we seek justice, if we do not seek justice, justice cannot come. If we do not seek Christ, the very thing that we celebrate today cannot bring to us the justice that we have been promised. The judgment was that we were sinners. The justice is that we are forgiven. The judgment was we were separated from God. The justice becomes we are joint heirs with Christ. The judgment was you could not have a personal relationship with Him. The justice is Talk to me. Do you hear me today? So when we set out and I began that day and I did for my wife and my brother what I knew to do even on a small part. I didn't even have full understanding, but I did on a small part all that I knew to do. And all that I knew to do was to wave that scepter that they had made. And it was, a, it was a very tangible representation of what I'm speaking of today. I wish I had one. I don't have one. If I had one, I would wave it today. That might be odd to people. They might say, why do you have to hold it in your hand? Because sometimes what we see buries itself in the part of us that doesn't understand. And I held that thing in my hand, and when I waved that over my wife, and in proxy over my, her brother and my brother. And I wave that over them. And begin to declare. You've already issued justice, Father. I mean judgment. Because the judgment is this. This is what belongs to them. But we have not yet seen the justice of that judgment. And we're looking for the justice in that judgment. And it was not but a few hours later that he released it. If you seek, you will find. If you ask, I will answer. If you knock, I will open the door. If you seek me, you will find me. Seeking justice is all about you and me. Recognizing in our own lives, in fact, I'm going to ask it this way before I even make the statement. As you sit under the sound of my voice, whether in this room or watching online today, as you sit under the sound of my voice today, in how many ways are you aware in your own life where you've been waiting on justice to come? the fullness, the right answer to come to a situation you have not yet received. You've been waiting on the right answer 
to come to you. Whatever that might be. Let me tell you what to do today. Seek that justice. And we seek it by recognizing first, Father, this is the declaration. I am receiving the fullness of your answer to the judgment that has already been passed. And I'm going to tell you, man, courts, nothing natural can withhold the power of God to release to you and me what the Father has promised us. If you will receive, if you receive Christ and you accept Christ, if you have not, I'm telling you today, He's your answer. Christ is not some idea. He's not a good thought. He's not a nice guy. He's the Savior of man and woman. He's the Son of God. For justice to come to you and me, we first have to acknowledge justice has not yet come. I first have to be willing to recognize judgment has been passed. But I'm not going to settle in judgment. That's the nature of religion. See, religion was judged... In this way, because man was judged as being sinners because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. Man was judged as being sinners. And religion has capitalized on that sinfulness. Religion has continued to keep mankind tied up and bound to the idea that they will never be worthy. They can never come to the throne. And if we can never be worthy, we can never be the temple of God that we sang about this morning. Religion has, finds its life in judgment. That's why the religious, those, the gathering in the sanctuaries is coming apart today. Because judgment in time will pass. Because judgment without justice will be a law forgotten. But justice, when it's served, is eternal. Because once the answer comes, I said to my wife, once the answer comes, it can never go away. I said to my wife over the situation when justice was served in her situation, her and her brother. When justice came to them, I said to my wife, Because there was a point in time she thought maybe we should pursue this in court. I can't give any details on it. It's irrelevant. But to you it wouldn't be a big deal. But to them it is. And she said maybe we should pursue this situation in court. And I said, this I knew. I said, if you go to court, judgment has already been passed. If you go to court, you're going to delay anything that might be happening, rolling down, justice rolling down like a river. You're going to put a kibosh on that. If you have to go to court, don't go to court until the judgment that's already been passed, till justice follows. And once the justice was done on that thing, now it's done, that can never be taken away. It was issued, you saw the fulfillment of it, now whatever you need to do, you can do that. Because it cannot be reversed. Listen to me today. Seek justice. Don't look for judgment. Judgment is God's business. But justice, that's up to you and me. God does the judgment. He does all the judging that needs to be done. Nobody judges better than God. It's perfect judgment every single time. But justice, he's holding in his hand and he's waiting for those who believe him to seek it. He said, I condemned you because of sin to death, but I hold in my hand life. 
And if you'll seek it by receiving Christ, this justice will become yours. Do you hear me in this house this morning? I don't know what in the world might be in your life. And I'm not talking about just spiritual things. I'm telling you today, I'm going to watch God move on your behalf in ways that are both natural and spiritual. And I believe during this time, you're going to be awakened to things that he wants to do in you, both natural and spiritual. Listen to me today. Listen to me online today. Both natural and spiritual things are going to come to you if you can accept and you can hear and you can receive what I'm saying to you today. There are things coming to you. There are things coming to you. Stand up if you would, please. There are things that are about to come to you. If you can receive and accept what the Father wants to do, if you can receive it. Listen, don't worry about the judgment. You might not even like the judgment. Judgment has nothing to do with what the justice is going to look like. But the justice can't come until judgment is made. That's the authorization for the next step, moving that ball down the field. And to get this thing moved down the field, I'm telling you, both naturally and spiritually in your lives, both naturally and spiritually, because we're speaking and releasing this word today, Holy Spirit is going to begin to make you, awaken you, awaken you to things that you have given up on. Judgment had come a long time ago, but you just never believed justice would ever happen. You, it was judged. You knew right was declared, wrong was declared. Nothing happened. You did not get what was coming to you. I'm telling you, the Father is about to release to you that we'll receive today. He's going to release to you. He's going to release to you. He's going to release to you. He's going to release to you today. He's going to release to you. You're hearing me this morning. What I got to do? I got to be one that says, I'm not going to settle in judgment. I'm not settling in the filthiness of law. The law does not determine my tomorrow. Determines my today. Law has everything to do with today and everything before it. Justice has everything to do with what's coming. Has everything to do with what, what I'm promised. And if you have not received what you were promised... If you've not yet received what you know you've been promised, if you've not received what burns in your heart, the desires of your heart, the desires of your heart that are that are in line with the purpose of God, I'm telling you, those desires are there because He put them there. Not because you got up this morning and had a good idea. You want justice? Seek it. Get out of that courtroom. You've been standing around there staring at that judge hoping he'll change his mind. I went to court with a young man that used to be a part of this house and his wife. They had some challenges. And they were down at Seminole County Courthouse. And I went down to that courtroom with them. This is years ago. This is probably 20, close to 20, 18, 20 years ago. And I went down to that courtroom And he asked me to come and be there with him, and he had been in jail for a few days, maybe longer. Don't remember now. But I went down there with him, and I'll make the long story short. But I sat on the back row of that courtroom. It was packed. And there's people, I mean, they just bring him up there, and that judge passes sentence. I mean, it's just one after another, boom, 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 boom. And I went down there to that courtroom, and I knew what this young man had done, and I knew what this young man had not done. I'd known this young man a long time. He was little when I met him. So I'd known him a long time. And I sat on the back row of that courtroom as as he stood up there before that judge and his attorney. And the judge says, how do you plead today? And the attorney said, well, he's going to plead guilty. And I knew. "Hmm, You don't know him like I know him. So I held my hand up in the back of the courtroom, Seminole County Courthouse. The judge looked back there and he said, sir, do you have something to say? I said, I do. He said, stand up. It's it's packed out. I stand up on the back row, and I said, I just want to say he's not guilty. And he said, are you his attorney? I said, no. He said, who are you? I said, I'm his pastor. He said, oh, okay. He said, and you think he's not guilty? I said, he is not guilty. And I said, and furthermore, that attorney right there, and I'm pointing at that attorney, I'm mad. And that attorney's okay. 
with him going back to jail and him saying he's guilty because that attorney's going to leave and he's not going to live with this man and he's not going to have to live with his family. So that attorney doesn't care. He's getting paid. He doesn't care. He's going to be paid by the state. And that attorney, he's just mad. So the court, the judge, which I thought was very kind, he said, why don't you and this attorney and this young man that goes to your church meet over here in this side room and, and decide how, what's going to happen next? You got five minutes. So I marched down the center aisle of that courtroom. I went off into this side room with that attorney and that other guy. And the attorney said, you don't think he's guilty? I said, he's not guilty. You don't know him. And I said to him exactly what I said in front of that courtroom. I said, you're going to leave today and you could care less. You'll never talk to him again. You don't care that he has a wife. You don't care that he has two children. None of that matters to you. And you're going to let him go to jail because you think it's a lighter sentence. He shouldn't be sentenced at all. He said, what would you do? I said, he's not guilty. I would say, not guilty. He said, well, they're not going to go for that. I said, what will they go for? And I don't remember what it was. He said, if you say not guilty, 30 days, whatever. I don't remember what it was. And I said, okay, do that. But don't give a guy a guilty judgment that is not guilty. We walk out of the courtroom. He stands up there in the front. He says, not guilty. The judge laughed, had him a little moment of laughter. And he said, what do you recommend? And the attorney said what he recommended. And the judge said, it's done. That was justice. Judgment came. And that was justice. I'm telling you, there's somebody doing the same thing for you in the same courtroom of your life. It's called the Holy Ghost of God. It's called the Spirit of Christ. There is somebody standing up in the back of that room for you today holding his hand up and he's saying, hold on, no, I'm not going to let them. Judgment has been passed, but I'm not going to let them live with that. I don't know whether the judgment is right or wrong, but I'm not going to let them live in this judgment. I'm going to believe with them for, for justice. I want them to get the right thing. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you today, whether natural or whether spiritual. There's people in this room, people watching me online today, you'll never know justice because you will never receive the giver of it. That's the unfortunate part. But those who will receive the giver of justice, who is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who died Friday and rose today. <laughs> he just died Friday. No. The one who died one day and rose three days later. The one who defeated death, hell, and the grave. The one who defeated the one that's passing judgment on you. Do you hear me this morning? But the only way we get justice is if we seek justice. Do you think justice would have ever come to Henry had I not lifted my hand in the back of that courtroom? Never. It had to be sought first. In fact, he didn't even seek it. He didn't know what to do. He felt like part of the system. How many of you feel the same way? You're just part of the judgment and there's nothing you can do about it. I'm going to tell you today. I am here to tell you. To, I am here to awaken you today. There is a lot you can do about it. You seek justice and God will move on your behalf. You seek justice and he will move on your behalf. Now, is he going to move today? I don't know. Is he going to move in three hours? Who knows? But he will. Justice is coming. It all begins with seeking justice. Next week, I'm going to talk about declaring justice. And the week after, justice served. We're going to talk about it. I encourage you to be a part of everyone. But before anything begin, can begin, you, gotta, you have to authorize the movement. You've got to move the ball. Father, I am seeking ju I have sat in this judgment for so long wondering when, but I have not really sought your word on it. And I am seeking your answer to this. Father, I lift my voice over the people that are present in this room, over the people watching online. Come on, lift your hands in this room. I lift my voice over the people, and we stand today in agreement that you are a God of justice. You are a God of, you are the only living God, and you are all about justice. So today, I speak and declare justice over every man, over every woman, over every person watching in this room or online today. I speak today and declare justice is coming to those who seek it, who seek it, whether it be natural, whether it be spiritual, in whatever way, let it be today. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Amen, 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 and amen.